Good afternoon, everyone. It is a real pleasure to be here. My name is Massimiliano Zattera. My background is in computer science, and I work as a consultant in the field of artificial intelligence. Before starting my presentation, I want to thank the organizers of this conference, especially Dr. Layfield, for this opportunity to present my work. I have to admit I feel a bit nervous about presenting a new transliteration alphabet in a conference where Dr. Zandbergen is a keynote speaker. But I guess it's too late now to change the topic. Uh, so without further ado, let me start. In this presentation, I will describe a concept I call slots, which I use to describe the inner structure of Voynich words. And then I will show a new transliteration alphabet I created based on this concept. Using this alphabet, I built a formal grammar for Voynich words, which has been used to produce some evidence about possible languages in the manuscript. Finally, I will summarize my conclusions. I want to clarify that each time I will use the term language, I mean, as Courier did, a subset of the Voynich which presents some statistical relevant features. I'm making no assumption on the language of the underlying text, if any. The transliteration I use for this work uh, is a concordance version that has been created from the landini stolfi interlinear file. As an example, you can see here a line of text that has been transcribed by four different authors in yellow. Uh, you can see in the concordance version on the bottom, when there is a disagreement, I mark corresponding character and the corresponding words as unreadable. Uh, as you see in the red boxes. These unreadable words are not considered in my analysis. This process is an attempt to autocorrect errors in transcriptions. It of course leaves out several word types, but on the other side it gives a solid starting point for a statistical analysis of the text. Since I'm looking for regularities in the text, I prefer to leave exceptions out, even if this reduces the scope of the analysis. It still leaves us with more than 31,000 tokens and 5,000 word types. This entire work begins with the consideration that glyphs inside words appear in a specific order. This was clear since early studies, as you can see from this quote from Tiltman. So this is nothing new, but with this work, I try to capture this concept more formally and use it to get some new insights about the manuscript. As a start, I created a computer program which allows me to specify an arbitrary number of slots and check and constrain the symbols that can occupy each slot. The program also provides useful statistics on how many words can be decomposed according to the rules I provide. This allowed me to explore different rule sets until I settled for one which strikes a good balance between simplicity and coverage of the word types. And the result of this process is shown in the table on the left. Each word type can be decomposed in 12 slots on the top. Each slot can be empty or contain a single glyph, and the choice of glyphs in each slot is very limited, like two or three. Each glyph can appear at most in a couple of slots, with the exception of D, which appear in three different slots. And pie chart in the middle show how words align to this structure. I define the regular words as words that follow exactly the slot structure. This covers about 87% of tokens and 51% of word types. Separable words are words which can be divided into two parts, and each part is a regular word itself. This corresponds to about 10% of tokens, 37% of types. And this can be words where space is missing in transliteration or a sort of composed words. I cannot really tell at this stage. And finally, the remaining terms, which I call unstructured, cover 3% of tokens, 12% of word types. Worth mentioning that about 80% of unstructured word types are terms which appear only once in the text. What I've shown so far suggests that slots are relevant for the structure of word types. If so, it is reasonable to assume that each glyph that appears in a slot is a basic unit of information. 
In other words, it's a single character in the Voynich alphabet. This brings me to propose a new transliteration alphabet, which I show in this table, and which for a clear lack of imagination, I call the slot alphabet. Uh, as you can see, it's very similar to the EVA alphabet with some difference shown in the table in the middle, which I'm going to discuss in the next slides. First point is about these glyphs, which are usually called gallows, pedestals, and pedestal gallows. Um, are these single characters, are they a combination of simple characters, or are they ligatures? In the slot alphabet, I assume each of these glyphs is a single character uh, for the reason that you see summarized in these bullet points. So C and H appear uh, outside the pedestal or pedestal gallows only 11 times. The combination of gallows in slot 3 followed by a pedestal in slot 4 is quite common and is written explicitly as two glyphs. In these cases, pedestal gallows should have been used instead if, there's, if there were a ligature of these two symbols. In about 300 tokens, we have a pedestal followed by a pedestal gallows. A ligature, in this case, uh, will correspond to a double pedestal in a word, which contrasts with the structure suggested by slots. In addition, double pedestals appear only in 17 tokens, suggesting again this is a very unlikely combination. And finally, gallows and pedestal gallows are preceded by different characters, as I uh, will show in the formal grammar I'm going to discuss later. For all these reasons, I assume these are individual uh, separate characters of the alphabet. In this slide, I discuss E and I, which appear in slot 6 and 9 respectively, and they appear as sequences of one, two, or three symbols. Again, are these distinct characters or repetition of the same character? And since these sequences appear always in the same slot, what I think is relevant is only the number of repetition. And it's a bit like with Roman numbers, like you have a sequence of 3i, you don't read this as a three-letter word, but as the number 3. And therefore, these are different characters in the slot alphabet as well. In the next section, I will present a formal grammar for Voynich words. Let me first quickly describe what a formal grammar is. A uh, formal grammar describes how to form valid strings from an alphabet accordingly to a set of formal rules. In this presentation, I write rules as shown here. Um, this notation means that the rule S can generate any of the two strings A or B and then be replaced by any of the other rule X or Y. For example, the grammar you see at the bottom of the page starts with a begin rule from which you can move to either rule A or B. If you choose A, you emit the letter A, and then you can choose again between rule A or B. If you choose B, you emit the letter B, and then you stop. So this process will generate strings such as B, A, B, A, A, B, and so on. But what is the point of creating a formal grammar? If slots are a meaningful feature of Voynich words, and if the slot alphabet captures the Voynich alphabet, it should be possible to use them to produce a compact description of Voynich words in form of a grammar. And hopefully this grammar will give us some insights about the text. So as a next step, I created a formal grammar starting from a concordance transliteration created using the slot alphabet and taking in consideration only regular words that exhibit a slot structure. Here you can see a graph showing characters appearing in each slot. The arrows represent how these characters follow each other in words. For example, you can see that Q, which appears only in slot zero, is followed almost always by O in slot 1. I created an algorithm to produce a formal grammar out of this graph, and the result is shown in the next slide. 
of course I will not go through this grammar in details, you can find it in my article. I said a grammar could provide a good and compact description of words in a language, but how can we evaluate how good a grammar is? So this table above shows that we can have four possible cases. We can have a word type that appears in the voynich and is also generated by the grammar. It's a true positive. If it's not generated by the grammar, it's a false negative. And on the converse, if the word type does not appear in the voynich but is generated by the grammar, it's a false positive. And if it's not generated by the grammar, then it's a true negative. We can then define the matrix shown below. The precision is the percentage of words generated by the grammar which do appear in the manuscript. So a grammar with precision 1 or 100% will generate only words that appear in the Voynich. Notice this does not mean it generates all of the Voynich word types. Uh, the recall is the percentage of words uh, in the Voynich that are generated by the grammar. A grammar with recall of 1 or 100% will generate all words in the Voynich, but it might generate many more that are not in the text. And you can imagine there is a tension between precision and recall. And one can increase recall by having a grammar to generate more words, but this increases the risk of generating words which are not in the Voynich, which reduce the precision. So there is a need to a single number that represents a compromise between best recall and best precision. And in theory of classifier, this number is called F1 score and is defined as you can see here. F1 tends to zero if either precision or recall tend to zero and is one if both precision and recall are one. In this slide, I compare the grammar I created here in the last row with grammars created by other authors. You can see it has the highest F1 score by an order of magnitude. A very important thing to mention here is that these measures have been obtained from the EVA transcription of the entire Voynich manuscript, while our grammar has been created using the slot alphabet and looking only at regular words. This means that slot and the slot alphabet are very effective in describing the inner structure of words. I said before that uh, formal grammar could be useful and give us insights about the text. And in the next part of the presentation, I'm going to show some of these insights. So the next step, I generated different grammars specific to each of the main sessions of the Voynich. And rules appearing only in some of these grammars were identified as potentially distinctive features for corresponding section of the text. So I try to explain what I mean here with an example. You can see uh, here on the left side, there is an extract of the grammar for the recipe section. And you can see the rule in red can be generated from the starting rule and it does not appear in the starting rule of the grammar for the entire Voynich, which means that this red rule will generate a sequence of E at the beginning of words for the recipe section and not for other sections of the manuscript. And therefore, it's a potential distinctive features of this section. This table shows the list of features I identified with this process and the percentage of tokens exhibiting those features in each of the different sections of the Voynich. And different colors show how much these percentages differ. For example, you can see this sequence highlighted here. It appears in more than 70% of tokens in the herbal A uh, section. It appears less than 4% for the language B and is almost absent in the biological session. Again, it was the formal grammar that allowed me to identify these different patterns in words. Finally, these features have been fed into a decision tree algorithm to classify pages into their section and the result is shown in this diagram. You see the resulting decision tree is surprisingly compact and uh, still succeeds in classifying pages with a 92% accuracy 
and is using only these four features I highlighted here in, uh, in the slide. As a test, uh, this experiment was repeated by assigning each page to one of five random groups. But the resulting decision tree had 11 rules compared to these five and an accuracy of only 54%. And this shows that structure feature we found are indeed correlated with section in the text. These results show that the difference between the section is not a difference in the set of words they contain, rather a difference in inner structure of those words. Of course, the latter will cause the former, but not necessarily uh, vice versa. So I try to explain what I mean with an example. Imagine we have a set of scientific papers in English. Uh, one would expect to identify those about climate change by looking at words they contain, for example, by checking the frequency of terms like thunder or thunderstorm. This will be a difference in vocabulary. It will be surprising if such a classification could be made by counting the words starting with th, because words with this pattern will appear in all English texts, more or less with the same frequency, regardless topic being discussed. This would be what I call a difference in word structure. And this difference, in structure is precisely what happens with the different section in the Voynich. They can be distinguished based on the character's pattern I showed before. And this could indicate that the two carrier's languages are just a major distinction within a group of at least five such languages. I hope in this presentation I managed to show you how there is a clear empirical evidence of an inner structure of words in the Voynich text which is captured here with the concept of slots. I also proposed the slot alphabet as a new transliteration alphabet and I argued how the slot model and the slot alphabet can be new useful tools to analyze the Voynich by creating a formal grammar of Voynich words, which are then used to provide some hopefully new and interesting insights on the manuscript, namely the existence of different languages in the different sections. I believe this work has some interesting implications summarized in these bullet points. First, the different sections of the Voynich are different in structure. They should be analyzed separately. Doing analysis over the entire document might average and hide the differences. Second, since no natural language exhibits a slot structure, any simple substitution cipher for the Voynich should at this point be clearly ruled out. This is not new, but such solutions keeps appearing. Third, the stronger regularities imposed by the slot structure clearly affect character level entropy in Voynich words, which should be considered when using this metric to produce any insight about the text. Finally, the slot structure and the grammar I created apply to the entire text. At the same time, I show how the different sections present a different inner structure of words. This suggests the existence of a general method to create the Voynich that has been tuned for each section. This indicates again that any attack to the cipher should be conducted separately for each section. This slide shows other implications specific to clustering. The difference in word structure across the different sections of the text will clearly affect the list of words appearing in each section. And in turn, this will affect any clustering algorithm that uses words as features. This means previous analysis that use clustering to support the idea of different topics in the text might be just a surfacing differences in the process used to generate words, not a different set of terms in the plain text. As an example, I show here a projection obtained by using structural features of words the same I've shown previously and that I used to create the decision tree. Each dot is a page in the Voynich and the colors represent the section to which the page belongs. You can clearly see how this clustering, which is based on structural feature, replicates the results of clustering based on words. And this ends my presentation. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, I provide here a link to my website if you are interested in more details and I'm now available for questions.